Second Thessalonians. Uh, we're ready to begin chapter two, but uh, before we begin that, uh, just go through a, a brief recap of, of what we talked about last week and some of the, the previous weeks before. Uh, as we said, this is Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Uh, this is a group that uh, he and Silas and Timothy had uh, had gone and, and preached the gospel to. We read about that back in Acts chapter 17, and uh, they, they spent a very brief time there before they were kind of chased out of town. Um, but this is the follow-up letter. We think it was written a couple months after um, his first letter to them. I believe it was still written from Corinth uh, while Paul was in Corinth. Uh, somewhere around the time, about 51, 52 AD, uh, you know, approximately two decades or so after Christ, Christ um, after he died. Um, and this letter was written, and it was kind of still touching on some of the subjects that Paul had addressed in his first letter. Uh, the Thessalonians were under intense persecutions at this time from Jewish Roman authorities um, and kind of trying to, to uh, suppress Christianity and, and suppress any type of this new religion uh, that, that was being preached at this time. And um, like I said, Paul has received word that they're still dealing with a lot of issues, especially what we'll deal with today, um, the return, the day of the Lord and the return of Christ. And that's something that they're, they're really struggling with. In his first letter, uh, that same issue arose and Paul was, was trying to comfort them on the fact of those who had died in Christ and those that had uh, were physically dead, that would they be left out of the resurrection? And he was correcting any, any, you know, wrong notions of that. And he was also addressing the uh, persecutions and the false teachings of the coming of the Lord that, that seemed to have been circulating there. And some who had been slandering Paul and some who had uh, been writing, I guess, like false teachings and false letters in Paul's name. Uh, so he, he's addressing all of those things. Then what we talked about last week, in the first chapter, uh, it's kind of broken down into three different different sections. The first one was more about the encouragement and the hope that Paul was giving. And then today, again, we're going to address the, the man of lawlessness, the return of the Lord. And then the final chapter um, breaks down an exhortation and also uh, condemning idleness that, it, that seemed to have been uh, popping up popping up in this, in this time. Um, we brought out last week that something kind of interesting about First and Second Thessalonians is that Paul uses the term Lord Jesus 12 times in 2 Thessalonians and 11 times in 1 Thessalonians. Um, and that was you know, really spotlighting the fact that Jesus is the true king. He is the true Lord, as opposed to the time frame where they were living under the Roman Empire. And they you know, had, had gone from, from one bad uh, Caesar emperor from, from the next one. You know, they, they've gone through Caligula, uh, will endure Nero in the short time before or short time to come. And so you had a lot of this corruption, but he's really pointing out that, that Jesus is Lord and he is the, the true Lord and King. Um, and like I said, he used that more times in these two epistles than he does in any of the other ones that, that we have recorded. Um, so that's kind of just a, a brief overview of First Thessalonians that we had. And so we'll, we'll begin with Second Thessalonians. And here in this section, like I said, it's more of an explanation of the day of the Lord is, um, is what he's trying to address what it seems like is that there were, were many, like I said, these false teachers who had come about, maybe even were stirring up a lot of confusion um, and a lot of fear amongst this, this young group. Because again, like I said, they, they were a very young group. They hadn't um, you know, only been established over the course of a couple months. Um, but yeah, they were still a very loving group. They had a very strong faith. They were looking towards Christ, trying to do what they were supposed to do. Um, but again, they had a lot of these outside sources that were really trying to hinder them throughout this. Um, and, you know, some people may even been predicting dates about the resurrection. They were uh, spreading the rumors that Christ had already come. And so, you know, they're, they're really, really struggling with this. And Paul, the biggest thing that he's doing, you know, I guess through reading this, like you, there has been a lot of like apocalyptic speculation, like who is this man of lawlessness trying to pin it on either different emperors, Roman emperors, uh, different uh, leader, world leaders that we've had throughout time. And what it really seems like, if you just take it for what it is and for what it's written as, um, you know, one of the first things I said when we started First Thessalonians, like anytime you're reading these epistles, it's like you're reading someone else's mail. You're reading, you know, this is written to a specific group of people. And it's kind of can be difficult for us 2000 years removed to, to kind of put ourselves in this in their shoes. And we might 
interpret it in a little bit different way than what, what this group would have done. But we think about Paul's true meaning and reasoning for writing this is to comfort them and to, to tell them that the return of Jesus, it should never inspire fear, but it should always inspire hope and confidence. And he is trying to make sure that they are, are come away more comforted than, um, than they are scared and refuting the claim that the Lord has already come and just encouraging the church to stand firm uh, and, and to cling to the truth that they have been told and not be kind of led away by some of these, these false teachers that they have. Um, yeah, so with all that said, we'll, we'll get into it, read the first uh, three verses. The first 12 verses are the events preceding the day of the Lord. But the first three verses kind of have some of the, I guess, introduction to it. So uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, we'll read the first three verses. Now we request, request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or by a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed in the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. So in these first, um, first couple of verses here, we see that, again, Paul is addressing these, these false teachers, the people that have written these letters, uh, supposedly being in his name. And a lot of this comes back to what was previously stated in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. So again, this would be fresh on their minds. They would have already had that first letter uh, and those all throughout Macedonia. You know, this group was, was well thought of and their, their love, their generosity and faith was known amongst the entire region of Macedonia, and Paul had even instructed them to share that letter with others throughout the region. So this wasn't just specifically, uh, you know, there were other congregations that were going through some of these similar issues and had some of these similar, um, I guess, concerns they had. Uh, but Paul's encouraged them not to be quickly shaken or disturbed uh, by these false letters, and that these Christians, you can think they're very vulnerable, um, especially during these intense persecutions that they were, they were undergoing, and many of them were scared that, that Christ had already returned like a thief in the night, as we read about in chapter five, and that they had all been left behind. So some of them may have felt abandoned um, or as if they, they didn't make the cut, you know, despite Paul's teachings throughout all of this. And uh, Paul reminded them that this is going to be Christ's return. It's going to be very public, uh, as he described it in chapters four and five of First Thessalonians. Um, this is going to be you know, the loud shout, the trumpet see Christ uh, in the sky. This is not going to be something that only Christians are going to recognize. This is going to be something that everybody, this is unmistakable what is happening and what is going on here. So just kind of reassuring them, it's not going to, even though he gives that thief in the night um, language, uh, you know, as something that would be secretive, he, he's trying to explain to them, nobody's going to know when they're coming, just like you're not going to know when a thief will be here. But when it happens, you know it's happened. Uh, you know, if, you, if your house has been broken into, you come home, you see it destroyed, you know something has happened. So it, it's going to be kind of that, that same line of thinking that he's trying to convey to them, but it's, it's very public. Um, and again, he had already addressed uh, in chapter four, uh, 1 Thessalonians, that fear that those who would be or physically dead, maybe do they had been martyred um, or, or for whatever reason they, they had died, that they're not going to be left out whenever Christ comes back. But we think about what is driving a lot of this, again, through the, the persecutions, it's fear. You know, no matter how um, illogical something may be, fear is a very powerful motivator and it's contagious. And you, it can turn a logical minded, convicted person upside down if it's perpetuated in the proper way and from many sources. Um, and we go back to reading in chapter five of 1 Thessalonians 19 through 21, when Paul has specifically addressed here these false messages um, and, and letters and spirits that I guess people are claiming in, in God's name that, the, that Christ has already returned. He says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. So again, he's saying that there are these prophetic utterances. There are spirits that are, you know, um, I guess, guiding the church. The Holy Spirit has been guiding them. He is that great comforter. But you have people who are um, misrepresenting the spirit and saying that they have they've heard this message. Uh, we th th can we think about any times 
just throughout the Bible, especially throughout the Old Testament, that there has been somebody who has claimed had a message from God or claimed to have been a prophet from God and has spoken something that was completely opposite of, of what, what God has said. Any other examples of false prophets? Right, yeah, exactly, and, and calls uh, that death. Yeah, I, I always think about that as, as well. Um, so yeah, so we, we know of certainly different instances uh, where, where that is happening. It seems to be that's what's going on here as well. Um, but, yes, sir. following the Thessalonian letters, and, you know, Paul, or same writer, he's dealing with the same thing with the saints in Ephesus as uh, he writes to Timothy, and he's specifically in 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 2, uh, where he talks about an I'm in the midst of Philetus. You may have brought this out last year. No, no we didn't. But I'm in the midst of Philetus, and he calls their teaching for fame, Vain babblings, increasing to ungodliness. Uh, and then he says in uh, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 17, their word will be as a canker. And uh, 18 he says, they heard say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they've upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands, as we see, not know that he is. God knows all that belong to him. But he's saying they were throwing the faith of many off by teaching that the resurrection has occurred in some way that it's already happened in the specific way that he right. But uh, that's a serious thing to say that it's already happened. Right. Yeah. They were faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it would Right. Uh huh. Yeah, and like I say, and with them being as vulnerable as they are, um, to and not to have that that rooted knowledge, like I said, being, being young Christians, that could be very disturbing to them. Um, and, and like I said, we see it. Obviously, this is not an isolated instance to this group. You know, that this is happening you know, with, with other groups. So that's why Paul really feels the need to to address that. Um, yeah, thank you for, for bringing that out. And so that's just what Paul is, is really encouraging them, you know, test it, test all things carefully, test these messages, um, hold fast to what is good, hold fast to what Paul, Silas, Timothy, what they were taught when they were there, don't easily be led astray, um, but, but anybody that, that is bringing these false messages or false things in Paul's name also, because it seemed to be, like I said, people were slander, someone was slandering Paul and had been saying things in his name. He's trying to refute that and to try to kind of bring ease to them. Uh, any other thoughts about the first couple of verses? Okay. Uh, so we'll get we'll read down um, the rest of four all the way through. Let's see where I want to go next. Well, actually, let's let's talk about that apostasy. It didn't get to that point yet. Uh, in verse three, it says, "No, let no one in any way." deceive you that it will, <clears throat> it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Um, so what, what is apostasy? Because that's falling away, falling away uh, falsehood. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great example. Think about, um, well, like Dari talked about from 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 1. It says, but the spirits explicitly say that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to the deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, and by, by means of hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as if, as if with a branding iron. Yeah, as Mr. Charlie says, that falling away. Um, and here again, we see this, uh, the deceit of false spirits and doctrines of demons. Um, so it's that, that, that is the apostasy. And we saw it going on then see it now, have seen it everywhere in between or in recorded history throughout there. Um, 
I'd like to read what Jesus said with this, because this, again, was not just isolated to the Thessalonians here. We think back in Matthew chapter 24, um, the first 13 verses, well, really it goes most of the chapter, but just, just reading the first, first, first 13 verses. So Matthew 24, uh, 1 through 13, I'm going to read that real quick. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, and it says, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the ages? And Jesus said, answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and, <clears throat> and, will, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars so that you are not frightened from these. Uh, and so, sorry, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nations will rise against nation, kingdoms against kingdoms, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This is the gospel of the king. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. Well, here we have Jesus, you know, his disciples, those that lived, walked among, whenever he was alive, um, you know, they're, they're concerned about this end of ages, end of time, and, and questioning, you know, tell us more about this, what's going to happen. And we see a lot of the exact same language used by Christ as what we see used by Paul. Um, and again, this, this was in specific reference to, to these, these disciples at that time, and they saw a lot of this stuff. Um, Caligula was, was the Roman emperor who lived, uh, you know, immediately right after uh, Christ, Christ died and was known to be one of the most vicious of all the emperors and until kind of Nero comes along and he tries to, tries to one-up him on, on his persecution of Christians and the things that he did and, and just how terrible he was for Rome in general. Um, but we see it just, like I said, a lot, a lot of this very frightening language, but Christ, you know, tells him there in verse six not to be frightened um, for all of this stuff. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, and that's what I was going to bring up is that, you know, Jerusalem fell around 70 AD, um, and so this, you know, Christ around 32, 34 AD uh, was when a lot of this was said, and then this letter to the Thessalonians was somewhere around that 51, 52 AD. So, you know, it's, it's still within a generation's worth, you know, the people that, that Christ spoke to <clears throat> and, and said this to, they, you know, it's very uh, possible that many of them were still alive with the destruction of Jerusalem. Does that, you know, does that sound like a, a fair statement to make? Um, so yes, it, it's kind of pointing to that. But then, like I said, looking back at, at uh, Second Thessalonians, we see like, what does that apostasy look like? And, and what is Paul I guess trying to to point to, um, do we think that it is that apostasy is still the the fall of Jerusalem that he is he is referring to, and you know he he's not necessarily saying that. I guess in refuting the false claims um, that the Lord has already returned, Paul is trying to highlight these coming events: rebellion, uh, man of lawlessness, and all that must happen prior to the return of the Lord. But he's also not say, seeming to imply that even once these events happen and once this man of lawlessness, whoever this, this may be, and whether it's just one particular person or not happens, that instantly the Lord will return. That it's, um, it's like these events are going to happen and then boom, the Lord's coming back. Because if this was pointing 
to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Here we are, you know, 1950 years or so after that, and obviously the Lord ha has not returned. Um, any any thoughts on that? I know this this is a this has been a very difficult thing for me to try to wrap my brain around and and to to dig into. So I yield to these much smarter people out here in the audience to to help with this. What do y'all think about this apostasy and the man of lawlessness? That's what I think. Right. Yeah, and going back to that, you know, Jesus is Lord. That, you know, why, that's why again, why I feel like He has said Lord Jesus so many times throughout this. He's reminding them, and this isn't meant to comfort. This is not meant to to stir up more strife and cause them more pain um, or more confusion. This is to comfort them, to answer the questions, and to let and remind them. Like I said, Jesus is Lord. You are in, in Christ. He is going to protect you no matter what is going to go on around you, which terrible things are were happening, will happen, and, and more is to come. It's the, kind of that preparation, that warning. Um, but yes, it, it, like I said, you can still lay, lay your head down at night and know that, that Christ is Lord, and, and that's what you can put your faith in. Any other, other thoughts about that? Um, and Jared had mentioned... Uh, and John, and we'll go back and talk about that in a little bit, um, but still, still touch on that some more. Um, all right, yeah, so we'll read the next uh, verses 4 through 10 will be the next section. Uh, so we'll pick up at the start of 4. It says, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object or of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God? Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you all these things? And and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, who now restrains, will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders, with all these, the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love, the truth, so as to be saved. So here in this section, <clears throat> again, the man of lawlessness, man of sin, and son of destruction, they, um, you know, they're, they're opposites to Christ. They, they oppose the Lord and they try to exalt themselves above every so-called God. Talk about taking the, the seat uh, in the temple of God and displaying himself as, as being a God. But I guess the question is, is who is this? Is it one person or is it a personification of, you know, many people, just a trait? Um, what do we think about that? One person. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Dempsey? A lot of the messages Think about in chapter one, verse five, where he talks about the righteous judgment that he that that God has this righteous judgment. Um, so yeah, like you're saying, those who he has, God is is righteous to judge. All those examples that you just uh, gave with the floods, Adam and Gomorrah, so many folks. Um, God was the judge. God was the the deliverer of those who were good with with uh, Noah and his family, um, but then the punisher of those who are wicked. And like I said, with this man of lawlessness, it will it will not be any different. Um, through that. Yeah. Good. As that person. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You you what? Sorry, I couldn't hear this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's always a trust in the Lord. Absolutely. Uh, any other thoughts uh, about that? Absolutely shows that that supreme power. Absolutely, yes, sir. You were going to say something. You know, what I always fall back on when there's this seems to be chaos in the world is you know our faith is being attacked by science, and philosophy, by one day this is legal, the next day it's not legal. There's just this cacophony of confusion, and yet the thing that I fall back on is I know that Jesus is Lord. I know that it's only him that can worship. And what you worship changes you. And the question that I always ask myself is, whatever it is that I worship, what does it allow me to do? Mm-hmm. 
And what does it compel me to do? You know, Paul wrote to Titus, he said that God has redeemed us and has made us a people zealous for good works. When we think about the fruits of the Spirit, these are things that we're compelled to do, compelled to have. And he says, against such there is no law. Right. And so whatever we are attacked by, we always fall back. We are good people. Peter said in the second first Peter 315, he said, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, he will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're getting attacked with, hold fast to that which is good. Right. And that's why I call that position. Yeah. You know? Yeah. God is good. And so if we, we stay to the standard and the standard of God and his word, then like I said, no, no matter what comes, then you will have that firm foundation. Absolutely. So that's great points. I appreciate that. Any other any thoughts about that? Yeah, Mr. David. Thinking about this in kind of a scholastic academic kind of way, mm -hmm. when we were writing a book report for this chapter, what is this chapter about? That it's not about telling us about what evil is coming, it's right. telling us how to get to eternity. Mm -hmm. So it, and it wasn't Paul's job here, it was not his purpose or his intent here to define. Some way we can make an action. Yeah. Be ready for that. Yeah. Like I said, and as I point out at first, this is to comfort them. You know, this is not to stir up more confusion, um, more, more fear. Because um, I think about in in uh, verse five, where or five and six, really, Paul is saying. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things and you know what restrains him now so that in the time he'll be revealed. It seems like Paul, um, you know, ha having that, that relationship, that close personal relationship, it's not that he went back and filled in all the blanks. It's I, I assume that this would have made a lot, would have been very clear to, to the readers uh, of this. And, um, you know, reading some commentators, it was saying that it could have been somebody uh, not necessarily a single person, but some of the events that he was kind of describing could have been within the Roman Empire, but yet he didn't want to uh, put that in writing, but actually told them that because if the letter got out when it was being shared, that could have increased their persecutions if you know it, it was seen as you know going against Rome, going against the Roman government and authority. Um, you know, we know what what Rome would do to any that dissented or that they saw as a threat, they, they would absolutely just wipe them out. And so Paul's not wanting to cause these folks more, more harm um, or more trouble. He, he is trying to, to comfort them. As Mr. David was saying, you got to look to the, <clears throat> look to the end of all matters with that. Um, and let's see what else. All right, and so then we go to, go to verse seven. It's like, so what, um, what mystery of lawlessness is at work and, and who is restraining this man of lawlessness? Who are we told restrains this restrains the, the man of lawlessness until this time? Who is that? Who, who has that power to do that? Holy Spirit? Yeah, well, yeah, certainly the Holy Spirit is comforting, you know, the with God and the Lord, again, coming back to the Lord Jesus, um, restraining this. Uh, and until that reveal day, until that that time, um, all the bad things that have happened since you know in the world since Christ, uh, since Christ walked on this earth and died, you know, Christ, our God holds that time, holds that time when Christ is coming back. He knows that time. He is restraining that until it fits into His greater plan throughout everything. Um, and in verse eight, it says that the Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth, as, as Carla had alluded to, or had said, um, you know, this is an allusion to Isaiah 11, four, that the breath of his mouth is the righteous judgment of the Lord. Um, so it's, it's giving that comfort uh, that the end after the man of lawless, lawlessness is, reve is revealed, that Christ wins. Like that, that is the end of all matters is, is something that is so simple with his breath, he defeats this man of lawlessness. Um, throughout this and showing that that shows that he truly is Lord. Um, something I found interesting in verse nine, where it says that um, the one who is coming is in accord with the activities of Satan with all powers and signs and false wonders. Um, so is the, the man of lawlessness will have this power 
it seems like to, to amaze and deceive with false signs. Um, and I'm sure there were many uh, living during this time that, that had those, I guess, ways to pull, pull people away, ways to deceive and, and uh, kind of to confuse. Do we see some of that today still, those that have the ability to, I guess with their uh, slide of hand, but they, they have that, that silver tongue to where, to where they can speak in a way that they can draw people away? Yeah, I think we certainly still see that. Um, and what is one of the best defenses that we just talked about against something like that, against these, these false teachings? Well, what can we always go back to? God's word, yes, Mr. David, he patted God's word. Yeah, you go back to God's word and you stay true to, to it. Um, and you know, God's word is written in a way that is simple enough for us to understand. You don't have to be some great theologian and have spent your entire life um, to be able to just understand the basic concepts. Yes, there are so many deep things. Every time you, you read over a passage, you may, may pull out something new um, and you're constantly growing in the word, but just the overall, it, it, is, it is Christ. And that is, that is what we need to remember. Mike? When you get down to verse 12, you know, the, the, the reason, you know, it's what there are 11. For this cause, God took it to the sun, that they should live a lie, that they all may be damned who believe not the truth. Mm -hmm. There's those who believe not the truth again, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that's the contrast thing they hear to not believing the truth. So, yes, you have to go back to the word to know what the truth is, but it's not really making a contrast between those who knew the truth and didn't know the truth. It's making a contrast between those who believed it right. and not who disbelieved it, but who had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, I think what God gets people off the path in the first place in a lot of instances, and in what's under consideration here, is when you take pleasure in unrighteousness, that you know the truth, but you live in such a way that you enjoy. Things which are unrighteous and ungodly, and then your understanding of truth has to be modified to allow for the way you're living. So I think when you get on that path of living in the wrong way, this is probably where you're going to end up. So the first line of defense is to not take pleasure in unrighteousness, to not enjoy those things that you know you're not supposed to enjoy. Yeah, and it kind of comes back to a heart issue. That the, once the heart is corrupted, then you you can find ways to justify anything that you do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a great point. Um, I think about in, in verse 10, um, where it says those, uh, those perish because they are deceived and did not receive the love of the truth. It comes back to love and that salvation uh, is then, it's not, salvation is not possible apart from truth and the love of the truth. You think Christ is the truth and salvation is through Christ. So is there a difference in knowing truth and loving the truth? Yeah, is there a difference in, in knowing the truth and a difference in loving the truth? Yeah, how? Yeah, well, one can be more of an academic knowledge and the other can be a, a practical application in your life and, and that living towards it, um, to where you're, you're not trying to justify any type of evil means or, or whatever lifestyle that, that you want to seek after. Because um, I, I always go back and, and think about, um, or like, like why did Paul use the term love and not knowledge of truth? Because as, as we said, there's that knowing, knowing what's right and doing what's right. Um, think about James 2.19, uh, where it talks about e even the demons knowing, um, let's just go back and read it. And James 2 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. So, you know, the demons had the knowledge, had the belief, but, um, you know, it again comes down to a, a heart issue and in, in what they, what you actually believe. Any thoughts on those, those few passages before we move on to the next section? I 
hear what I'm saying. I don't know what to say. I know what to do. I know what to do. I don't 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 know what to do. Yeah. Yeah, and, and kind of leaving, leaving any of that remnant um, and think about what your grandmother was saying. Like it is, um, hey, what is this? I just like completely go blank. You, you had so many good, good points throughout there and then there, there was one earlier on it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, and the moral standards, that's why I was saying what you're saying is you know no better to do it, but you convince yourself to do it. Um, you know, when we hold ourselves to a standard other than God's word, then we can say like, well, so-and-so or this certain group is doing this. And then you can kind of say, well, I'm, I'm better. I'm, at least I'm not doing that. I'm not that bad. So, you know, it's easy to kind of justify those things. Yeah, Mr. Eddie? And I think Mike kind of connect that to the previous section really helps us understand why this man of waltz, that's whoever you know, that has reference to, it. that's why he has that success, is because there are people who do not love truth, but instead they love unrighteousness. Right. So if you have those who love unrighteousness, God allows one to feed into that mm -hmm. uh, so that the judgment of God is very clear, it's, it's distinct, and there's no one who can say, well, I'm not really sure that person you know, can be convinced. God has made it very clear. He's, he's given them an influence that they want, allows them to follow that to make his judgments true. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a great point. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what Paul is saying in Romans <laughs> chapter 6, verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to violent passions. And then he explains how all this happened. He said, he, and even, even though there's so much evidence for God, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, it's not that there wasn't evidence. Mm -hmm. They just said, we don't care. Yeah. We, we, we don't want the knowledge of God to be part of how we think. Right. And that's a different thing mm -hmm. than sinning in ignorance. It's a yeah. hundred. Right. And I wonder if sometimes that constant choice is because you don't want that conviction. Like you, you don't, you don't want to be wrong. And you don't want to acknowledge that you're wrong. Something like that. Absolutely. Um, okay. And yeah, I know in, in 10 and, and 12 certainly tie into to one another. We'll, we'll try to get through 12 um, before because we only have a, have a couple more minutes left. Um, so let's read 11 through 12. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will, be, they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged and who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. So as to so many points that have been made um, th throughout all this, this diluting influence uh, or false uh, false persuasion. I also see that back in 1 Kings chapter 22 uh, where King Ahab, he wants to go to war uh, against Ramoth Gilead. And this is the time of uh, prophet Micaiah it's all, you know, Ahab says, oh, you, you're always are prophesying against me. Um, I, we don't have time. I'd, I'd like to go back and read it. But basically, he, he's saying, you know, give me the truth. And initially, Micaiah, he, he tells him what he wants to hear. He's like, no, don't do that. Tell me, tell me not what all the other prophets have said. Tell me what, what you know is to be true. And of course, it's, it's a prophecy uh, against him. And um, he's like, I knew it. This is exactly, you know, what, what always happens. We see where Ahab's heart was in that 
he he wanted to do something. He's always been evil. He he wanted to go down this this path that is not against God or that is against God's will and not in accordance with God's desires. And even though this man of God tells him that, he still wants to go down that path. So it, it can be the exact same in our lives today that, that we can know what's good, know what's right, but we still have that desire to go you know, a separate, separate path and, and kind of deviate from, from what God um, says. And it's uh, the heart. Since God knows all of our hearts and he uses, when I think about this deluding influence, he uses the desires um, of people to accomplish his will and to allow people to be deceived by these false prophets. Ahab obviously wanted to go to war. He knew the prophecy. He per- it was perceived to be evil against his plans, um, but the, he, his wills were not aligned with God's. And we see when our will is not aligned with God, where the destruction can, can you know, come in with that. Um, and then just, just quickly talking about verse 12, where <clears throat> 12 goes back to where, where verse 10, where they did not love the truth to be saved. Behind it in, Unconvinced, <clears throat> excuse me. Behind an unconvinced mind lies a, lies a hard heart, and people reject the gospel for moral, not intellectual reasons. Uh, if a so-called scientist says they don't believe in God because of the evidence uh, that they that they are interpreting the evidence through these skewed views, especially think about through um, you know creation, evolution, uh, but to look at the world, universe, human body through this pure lens, then it's impossible not to see a creator, this master designer. And it's also the same group who are easily deceived or who take pleasure in, in wickedness. Um, and it shows just this lack of moral character, lack of moral desire, uh, how they're easily enticed. And that's completely opposite from the Christian walk that we see in Ephesians 4, 17 and 18, that this, uh, this opposite of God's will and opposite of the Christian walk, it leads to futility, darkness, ignorance, uh, hardness of heart, and in following after worldly standards. I know that was a, a lot of words just to kind of throw in at the end, but I want to try to kind of tie, tie up this, this last section. Um, any, any final thoughts before we, before we close this morning? I really appreciate all, all the help, and we will pick up in 13 uh, next week. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you. 